So last week we uh, looked at the first uh, four verses of Hebrews, and um, we answered a series of questions that, that, that the text itself brings up. And today we're going to finish off the uh, chapter one. Um, and as we get ready to go on that, uh, as you were reading this last week, Hebrews, and as we did the study last week, were there any questions that you had before we get going? Okay. If, if as I'm going, something's unclear... Just raise your hand and I'll stop, okay? And uh, we'll pick up in verse 4, because last week we kind of went through a lot of different things and it got maybe a little bit confusing. So he became superior to the angels just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. So let's just kind of recap what we talked about last week, just very quickly. Before Jesus became incarnate, uh, he was still God, but then he became God. I'm sorry, but then he became man while still being fully God. So when he was resurrected, he became superior to the angels because he had been in fallen human body before. Okay, so that's what this is talking about. He became superior to the angels. He had previously been superior to the angels, but then because he took on a human body... He became lower than the angels, but he was still God. Okay, so then after he was resurrected, he became, once again, superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. Um, so, you know, he didn't stop being God. That's one of the things that is oftentimes um, kind of just twisted from Philippians. So Philippians 2, 5 through 7 says this, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, do not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Now, different translations say that differently. Some of them say as something to be grasped, as you know, so on and so forth. But the idea is essentially the same. He didn't see his godhood as something to, as like a status to, um, hold on to, but he was willing to lay down himself and become a slave for our benefit. And that's the idea there. So instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, um, and then it goes on from there. But the moral of the story being here that Philippians is trying to show, Jesus did not cease being God when he came on the earth. Okay, He just um, set aside his uh, titles and his right and Sir came as a servant instead. The plan of creation from creation, there's a lot of people who think that God basically had to improv, right? So he had no real plan, and people messed up, and he's like, well, now I've got to find some way to fix it. But the plan for creation from the very point of creation was for Jesus to inherit. That was... That was the end, the end game, was for Jesus to inherit. So, he, so Jesus acted in history. He, he came down as, as a person. He, he, he came and lived among us and then died. He acted in history so he could inherit. The idea there, we, we talked about last week, um, that a promise unfulfilled is a lie. That's kind of, the, kind, of the, kind of the idea there. Okay, so Jesus was eternally worthy, but he received the pay after service is rendered. So that's why it says he inherited something. Well, wasn't he already worthy? Yes, he was worthy, but he hadn't done the thing yet. So now that he's done the thing, he is officially the heir. And then we looked at last week, he became the inheritor of creation, titles, the reputation, the names, all that. Um, there is a, a heresy of sorts that goes something along the lines of this, that... Um, Jesus just appeared as a man. He wasn't actually a human. Well, no, no. We can know that he was actually a man because Hebrews gives us quite a few different evidences. Um, first off, it says that he was lower than the angels, and this is a verse where he's talking about 
people, humanity. And it's actually going to come up here in just a couple of, in just a couple of verses. Um, and then the second thing is we see that Jesus was born. This is something that's attested to in the Gospels. It's attested to by his family. He was not simply appearing to be a man. He was actually a man. Uh, and then it, he was... Um, he was. Uh, he he died after he after he lived on the earth, um, and he. he well, I I, I should have should have I should have reworded this when I made it. Raised doesn't mean raised from the dead. It means raised in life. He he grew up. Um, there were people who saw him growing up in the tabernacle. This was something where he actually fully was a human. So now we can kind of move on through Hebrews. Hebrews 1, 1, 5 says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, and today I have become your father. Once again, that point in time when Jesus became something that he previously was not. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, And let all God's angels worship him. So he's doing this contrast and comparison between Jesus and the angels. And Jesus is superior to the angels. That verse in verse 5, where he says, You are my son, today I have become your father, is a quote from Psalm, 20, Psalm 2, verse 7. And the idea of that psalm is that God reigns above and inherits uh, nations. So that verse obviously is something that, that, that connects with what he's, the author is talking about. And then he says here, I will be his father and he will be my son. That is a quote from 2 Samuel 7.14 and 2 Chronicles 17.13. And it's interesting because the, that's actually talking about King Solomon, David's son Solomon. And uh, this is kind of the way prophecy works in the, in the Bible. It'll have, it'll have multiple fulfillments and kind of like – it's kind of like looking at a mountain range where there's like different uh, layers to the range. Um, you know, you have your, like your front range and like in the distance you have like another range. That's kind of how biblical prophecy is too. You will have this prophecy and it won't all be necessarily fulfilled at one point in time. It will have like multiple different – times when it's fulfilled or fulfilled in part. And uh, so this is something that, yes, was being talked about Solomon, but more so than that, it was pointing forward to uh, the Christ. And this is a biblical, well, it's not just in the Bible, but it's used quite a bit in the Bible. It's a biblical device called foreshadowing. That's where something happens that shows, that points to a later, greater fulfillment than is currently being realized. So then you get to verse 6, and it says this, again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, and let all God's angels worship him. Firstborn, and the idea of firstborn is, is an ancient uh, kind of, uh, it's, it's a culture mindset. The firstborn was the one who uh, ran the household. It was the one who took over um, to kind of, in fact, many times before the father even died, the firstborn would be stepping in and negotiating the, um, uh, the, the daughters being married and stuff. They'll, they'd negotiate the, the prices and all that. Uh, so firstborn was, was more of the idea of uh, the inheritor of the household. So obviously that's why Jesus is having this title. And I think that this verse is very interesting that, that uh, is quoted here because it, it points out that Jesus didn't stop being God. It's, look at what it says. When he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So this is, this is a very interesting idea here. Only God is worthy of worship. And he says that the angels are worshiping him. So once again, the idea that, that Jesus somewhere along the way became God is not supported in the Bible. Th this becomes increasingly important because we live in a time when there's a lot of cults uh, saying stuff and a lot of Christians getting into New Age teachings. And so it's Im very important to clarify again and again what the, what the Bible actually teaches about these different things. So... Uh, Jesus didn't become God at some point. And, and if you're familiar with Christian literature, there's, there's quite a few uh, Christian writers who are very well known um, that aren't really saying things that are overly true. Uh, Bill Johnson, ben, uh, Benny Hinn. Um, there's another one, too. I just can't think of his name. But the idea that they say is, is something along the lines of this. Jesus could only do what he did because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we can do the same things and even more things in Jesus because we can be filled with that same Holy Spirit. And it sounds good, uh, except for when you take it a little bit bit by bit. So let's look at uh, well five different things on your sheet. There's only going to be four on the on this slide, but there's five different things of, of how 
that's not overly true. No, um, we cannot do the same thing as as, as uh, uh, Jesus. First off, and second off, Jesus wasn't able to do things only because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So, point number one is that Jesus was God. So, <laughs> there's that. We don't become God even when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, point number two, uh, Jesus is created. And that's something that we will not do, even if we're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's just not going to happen. Another thing is Jesus forgives, and he you know, is the uh, mediator in heaven. That's something we will never be able to do. Um, Jesus died on account of us. That's something we will never be able to do. Point number four, uh, Jesus had glory before he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And remember, the Godhead itself had glory before creation ever happened. God didn't need to create the world. He didn't need to create people to get worship. He was already already there. Um, when, he created, when he created time, he created people, but it wasn't for something that he needed. Um, and I think that's kind of a foreign idea to us. And then the fifth thing that I want to point out as to why we know that it's not true, that he only did it just because of the Holy Spirit, is because... So the Trinity has unity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they have unity among themselves. Okay? They don't, there's not this point where Jesus, see, we think about it in human terms. So Jesus was dependent to get the power from the Holy Spirit because that's, that's what we do. In order for us to cast out demons, we need the Holy Spirit. So we think in similar terms. But the Trinity doesn't have that separation like that. To, to, to kind of... Jesus was powerful by himself. He was also filled with the Holy Spirit when he was on earth. See what I mean? And there wasn't like a... Um, th- th- there's, there's this, there's this ever-present unity between the Trinity, and it's just something that's, that's oftentimes mi- mis- kind of overlooked uh, in these kinds of writings by these, uh, by these pastors. Um, so I think that's something that definitely we need to keep in mind. And we, we get to verse 7, and it says this. And about the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his, and his servants a fire flame. Now, this is an interesting verse. In the Hebrew, it doesn't read this way. In the Hebrew, it reads, he makes winds his messenger and fiery flames his servant. That's how it reads in the Hebrew. But the writer of Hebrews isn't quoting the Hebrew He's quoting the Greek. It was called the Septuagint. And in the Septuagint, it says, he makes his angels winds. It flips it around. And it is servants of fire and flame. So in the original Hebrew, the idea is this. God uses things like wind and fire to get his message across. Well, in the Greek, that's not, that's not the main point that it's making. And in, in the Greek, once again, his angels become winds and his servants of fire and flame. And there's a, a couple reasons why he says that. Uh, first off, I want to say this. This is, this is passages from Psalm 104, verse 4, in case you want to look it up on your own. But uh, the angels, well, let's kind of take it step by step. Let me start at the beginning, okay? So I- the first thing to note, notice from this is that he specifically says that the angels are his angels. These are Jesus' angels. He makes his angels wins and his servants of fire flames. So that's kind of an important thing there. And, uh, but it goes on, they worship and serve him, okay, so in the last verse we had that he, they worship him, and this one that we have that they serve him, and the, the, the imagery used here, winds and fire, these are both things that are very, very changeable, which is important because in verse 8 through 10-ish somewhere, he's going to talk about G- how Jesus is unchangeable. So he's here talking about the angels being changeable, and he's going to talk about how Jesus is unchangeable. So it's kind of a contrasting comparison there. Um, but also there's the idea that the angels are basically pronouncing his desire, which, which is possibly a reference to the, the Old Testament. Uh, for instance, if you remember when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, you had the angels went there, and then there was fire burned the city. Um, when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, uh, there was wind and there was fire. Um, so this, this is quite possibly a, a reference to that. <coughs> And uh, before we move on to the part about Jesus being um, unchangeable, it's worth pointing out that there's this idea that's gotten going kind of recently. Well, not recently. This has been going on for years, I guess, that people become angels when they die. That somewhere along there, because it says that um, when we go to heaven, we become like the angels, that somehow that that means that we become angels. 
Um, I think this verse alone, well, actually, this, this chapter alone kind of dispels that idea. Uh, angels are spirits made by God to do his bidding. They're messengers. Um, they are not... Um, they, they they're not something that was before. An- angels were ex- were created long before humans existed, and so there's there's that. Um, as far as the Bible tells us, uh, people never become angels; they get a resurrected body. That doesn't mean that we get um, angelic bodies. It means that we have we're still human, but that humanness is void of the ability to sin. When we get to heaven, we will no longer be able to sin, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so then in verse, verses 8 through 9, um, it says, But to the Son, your throne, God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. So <laughs> there's a lot going on here. <laughs> I, I, let's... <laughs> The the first thing I want to kind of point out is is the idea here is that Jesus is eternal, he's not uh, he's not um, changing like the angels, so that's a direct contrast. But he's also kind of just. If you notice here, your throne, God. This implies the idea of him being a ruler. So if he's a ruler, then that kind of brings up the idea in our mind: judge versus the angels, who are the ones who are sent by the judge. A big contrast there. Um, obviously, this kind of conjures up the idea of the ruler. Now, uh, this is important because in the Jews' mindset, uh, King David was, you know, the ideal ruler. He was they, he was always the one referenced to. It's like Moses was the ideal prophet. You know, they always had these like standards. Moses and David, they're like the untouchable ones, and uh, in in their in their mind, and, and so with that. And so with that, there's this constant idea in the Old Testament where it's talking about David, about his throne never ending, and he'll carry on for forever. Well, this is one of those discretions, uh, not discretions, um, I can't remember the word, uh, things in the, old, in the Old Testament scriptures that w- sounded like a contradiction because it didn't come true. It sounded like some kind of a paradox, but that's because it was a pro- prophecy coming to be fulfilled, and Jesus is that fulfillment here. So the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. He's taking the place of David here. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you. So there's this interplay between the Father and the Son. And uh, uh, and as David, they wanted him to rule forever. Jesus would actually rule forever. Um, and here it says that he was anointed by God has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. And the idea here is that for him, for Jesus to be anointed by the Father is that he's a special or unique um, son, um, one who has favor, um, one who is uh, specially anointed to mediate between us and the Father, someone who uh, is an inheritor. Um, and then it gets to the idea there. It says, uh, has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. So off the top of your head, who would you say the uh, the companions are? Anybody? Who in the world are these companions that, that Jesus has been um, beyond, anointed beyond? Satan? Good idea, but no, Satan was an angel, my dear. But that's a good answer, good answer. Anybody else? Kind of a tricky question, isn't it? Well, remember the context. We've been looking at this on Sunday nights. Whenever you're unsure about something, always kind of read the verses around it, see what's going on, what's the flow of the argument. And in this one, uh, we know that he's um, talking about the way that he has became a person. So the companions that he's been anointed beyond would be humans. He became one of us. We were his companions. And then he was anointed past it. See, this, was, this is actually one of those verses that's taken out of context to talk about the way that Jesus and Satan are, 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 are brothers. Uh, if you're familiar with, I believe it's Jehovah's Witness, I believe is the one. That sounds right. I believe it's Jehovah's Witness. The Jesus and Satan are, are, are brothers. And so Jesus isn't like, you know, 
and they use verses like this to talk about, okay, so co- Jesus and Satan were companions, and well, uh, that's not what he says. He says, beyond Jesus' companions, is plural. So we're not talking about him and, and Satan, because Satan was a created angel, and Jesus was an uncreated God. Not an, but the uncreated God. Um, so uh, the, the, the com- companions there are, are humans. So bec- this is obviously because of uh, Jesus' um, Jesus personhood. Now, if you notice here, he says, um, you, have, you, Jesus, have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you. The idea here is because of Jesus' godhood, he has favor with the godhood. And that sounds like a little bit of a uh, redundancy, but no, it's more of a clarification than that. So the Trinity lived in, um, I, I don't want to use this word because it sounds kind of wrong, but it, it, it's the idea behind it. The Trinity lived in self um, exaltation before the creation ever existed. They brought glory and honor to itself, his self. Does that make sense? So he didn't need to create something to get glory and honor. He already had glory and honor among, among himself. Uh, this is something that's talked about throughout the Bible, and I don't really want to get into it because it's kind of a lengthy discussion. I'm just kind of giving you a highlight here. <laughs> Read the prophets. <laughs> and uh, uh, But... Uh, it, it, so it sounds like what he's saying is Jesus did a thing and therefore God honored him. Well, God honored him because he was God and he was going to do the thing and he did the, do the thing, so then he got the honor. It's kind of like a uh, circle. I, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but you get the idea that I'm talking about. Um, so Jesus uh, interceded and was exalted. So here's a here's a question. <laughs> this one, this one's a difficult question for you guys. <laughs> Why was it used of David? Why was this passage? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you go back to that other one there? The one that starts off, but to the sun, your throne, God. That one. Why was this used of King David? Da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's a hard question, am I right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so close. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can tell Todd's right at the door. <laughs> right at the door. <laughs> so 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 yes. Yes, he, he, G, Jesus is of the line of David, the forever and ever uh, part. Any ideas? Because it says here, it says here, this is why God, your God, has anointed you. Originally, he's talking between David and God, and he's referring to David as God. So why, oh why, is this not blasphemy for him to refer to David as God? What is going on here? See, <laughs> this one took me a while to figure out, let me tell you that. But uh, here's the idea, okay? Um, in, in Hebrew, there's this word that's used of God. It's called El. But it's also called Elohim sometimes. I'm, I'm sure many of you have probably heard of, of that word. Here's the thing about Elohim. Elohim doesn't necessarily mean God. It, mean, it means God, gods, a ruler, a judge, a um, a spiritual being of any kind, such as an angel. Uh, it really, there's, there's, there's a whole I- a set of ideas behind this word. Elohim does not just mean God. And I'll make it even more confusing for you. There was a Canaanite God who's not the God of our Bible, who is called El. And then there's the God of the Bible, who's sometimes called El. And then <laughs> there's people and rulers and judges and gods who are also called El. And the entire... Translation is completely dependent on the context that it's used in. Boy, what a pickle. This is why that one psalm says, um, uh, God, God said to the, to the throne, you are gods. It's a play on words in Hebrew. It doesn't come across in the English. Uh, so, you know, the false teachers really have a heyday with that verse. But, but no, 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 we are, we are not gods. It's, no, 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 no. <laughs> the idea here is, is obviously that um, he, there's a play on words between the ruler, David, and God, the God. So God, ruler, your God, 
I'm sorry, uh, why God, uh, David, the ruler, your God, which would be Yahweh. But the Hebrew never uses the word Yahweh. It's just an interplay between that. And Hebrew does a lot of things like that where there'll be, there'll be a text that, that's kind of a little bit difficult to translate or, or maybe comes across but doesn't come across as good as it does in Hebrew. And then in Hebrew, like, there's this whole thing going on between, like, uh, play on words and poetry and stuff and all kinds of stuff, and it's just not there in English. And uh, so because David was a king, he acted in the place of God. That's, uh, that was an ancient thought that the, the rulers acted in the place of God. And uh, then obviously the word Elohim being used there. But then also, like Todd was saying, this is looking forward to the day that Jesus would fulfill this. Um, and the thing is, here, here's really cool about, about Psalms. Psalms is a book of layers. This book is just amazing. Okay, On the basic level of Psalms, this is David or Asaph or whoever else singing a song to God. But then there's another layer of, oh, this really relates to me. And I can pray using the Psalms as my guidebook, if you will. But then there's another layer of Psalms, which is the Psalms are la- largely prophetic. In fact, the way that the Psalms are used in the New Testament are predominantly prophetically, which is a really cool idea because, you know, you've got the, these songs that are just David crying out to God, and then it comes right back, and, oh, yeah, that, that's talking about the Messiah all along. Oh, who would have ever guessed? And it, I just thought that was cool. So uh, this verse, uh, if I didn't mention already, was from uh, Psalm 45, 6 through 7. And uh, then that takes us to, yeah, go ahead. Right. 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 Did everybody say hear what Todd said? Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. That's what I was trying to get a, get apart with that with that point. I'm I'm very glad you 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 highlighted that out. So what what Todd's talking about is the way that the king was talked to as the representative of God. So if you if you read in Exodus, it says t- Moses is talking. He says, "I'm going to make you God to Pharaoh." And that's what he's talking about, the representation. Another good example of that, Todd, since you brought it up, is in, in when, um, when the angel of the Lord is talking, it's not always Jesus. Sometimes the angel of the Lord is an angel that is talking with the authority of the Father. He's going in the Father's place as a representative, which was a very common ancient, ancient belief. So uh, that takes us to verses 10 through 12. Chapter 1, 10 through 12. And this is a quote from Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. And the idea here is it's going to contrast the creation with the creator. Okay, here we go. And in the beginning, Lord, you established the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. This is talking about Jesus doing these things. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. You will roll them up like a cloak. And they will be changed like clothing, but you are the same, and your years will never end. So this is the co- talking about the way that Jesus continues on, but it also talks the way, about the way that Jesus existed from before time existed. In the beginning, Lord, you established the earth. He stepped into time, created time, and did it with his hands. So there's a couple really, really cool things about this that I'm going to point out. The first thing is, is notice very specifically, it says, the heavens are the works of your hands. Just like the, the, the power and intimacy involved in this. And then the second thing is that Jesus is unchanging. We just saw how the angels are all changing. They're like fire and wind, but Jesus is unchanging. And so then it takes us to verse 13, which says, Now to which of the angels has he, uh, he being the Father, ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Now, this is, is, is a very interesting verse because remember last week we were talking about the way that sometimes people get it in their head that the Father and the Son are not equal. That there's like um, a little bit of a dependency there. You know what I mean? Like, and, and not to say there isn't a dependency, but once again, there's a unity in the Trinity. There, there doesn't have to be a, a dependency. There, there's, there's perfect union. And the idea that people get is because Jesus did the will of the Father, that means that Jesus is lower than the Father. Maybe they're both God, but like, you know, obviously the Father has the upper hand. And this verse completely refutes that idea. 
Because here you have the father saying to the son, you sit down until I finish my job. So this is kind of a very interesting uh, dynamic here. So obviously we looked at this before. It's a place of honor while the father does his work. Uh, proof that Jesus is not less, absolutely, um, than the father. And uh, also this once again hits the idea of the roles of the Trinity. Um, for countless generations, there's been a lot of different heresies that have come up, all revolving around the general idea that G between who the Trinity is. Is it three gods or is it one god and he just keeps changing his faces, like masks that he wears? This has been a recurring heresy. It's come on, think back. All the way from the 300s uh, A.D., just, you know, a couple a couple years <laughs> into the Christian church's existence, well, I guess a couple hundred years into the Christian church's existence, all the way until today. This heresy just keeps repeating itself over and over and over again. And first off, we see that these are two different persons, but there's only one God. But then the second thing is that we see that there are different roles that the different people in the Trinity take. For instance, Jesus said of the Holy Spirit that he cannot come until I go. So there's, there's a switching of, of what's happening. Okay. Another thing is the Father never died on the cross, the Son did. So yeah, there's a lot of different things where there's different roles that the Trinity has. It's it's it, the, the near the, the nearest thing I can think of off the top of my head is is, is a marriage, right? So in, in any marriage, the husband and the wife don't do the exact same things. You know, I mean, they have their way of making their marriage work, and they take on different roles. Maybe this person does that one, and this one does that that one. Either way, there's this idea that there's different roles to get the marriage going. Were you trying to say something, Maria? No. Okay. And it's kind of the same with the Trinity. They, they, all, they each have their, their different roles that they're doing. The Holy Spirit, for instance, is the one who re, um, revives us inside. He's changing our heart, what we, what we think and act like, okay? But Jesus is the one who's mediating on our behalf before the Father. Jesus died to save us from the wrath of the Father. Okay, so there's this, there's this, this role of the Trinity. Not, not to say that Jesus is not bothered by sin, Obviously, the Bible is absolutely clear about, about that. But. So they all have their different roles. Angels are not eternal. They are not all-powerful. They are not unchangeable. These are all things in contrast to Jesus. Uh, and this, is, this verse right here takes us exactly where we are now with Jesus. This verse applies to right now. Sit at my right hand and tell me, make your enemies your foot. So that's exactly what's going on right now. That's why we don't see everything yet set in order. Because although Jesus has become the inheritor, that's all set and ready to go. These are the last, the last days. But Jesus is right now sitting at the right hand. He has not realized his throne yet, while the Father continues with what he's doing. And then this brings us full circle to where Jesus said, I don't know when that day is. The Father knows, and that's exactly what's going on now. Jesus still does not know. And when, it's, when the Father says now, well, it's now. <laughs> that kind of makes sense. So, um, so Jesus is the inheritor sitting at God's right hand. If you notice, this takes us uh, back to the very beginning of Hebrews chapter one. Uh, it mentioned about the way that long ago God spoke through the Son and talks about these different things, and then it says it makes a comment. Uh, when he had made purification for sins, in verse 3, it says, after he had made purification for sins, he sat at the right hand of the Father. And now here we are full circle, and he's finishing that up with a quotation that says exactly that same thing. This is an ancient device called an inclusio. Uh, the idea here is that you start and end with the same kind of idea, and it kind of uh, is just a way of, of making your argument pretty. It's a, it's a, was a was a good way of presenting your argument. Uh, and, and you'll see kind of this, this same repetitive cycle throughout the book of Hebrews. Something will be mentioned, oftentimes numerous times, and then it'll, it'll, he'll talk about something else and come back around and talk about it in greater detail. So some of the things that he talked about in chapter 1, you're not going to come into again for a couple of chapters, but he will come back to it. And... Uh, And so the basic idea here is obviously uh, that Jesus is superior over the angels. And that takes us to verse 14, which is the final of this, um, 
of this uh, chapter. And it says this. Are they, talking about the angels, not all ministering spirits, sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? So there's an idea here. Angels are messengers. They're servants of God. They work on his behalf. They work for the good of people, too. Um, and there's a bigger idea here that, that this kind of talks about. In, in modern circles, there's kind of this idea that, that, that God doesn't care. He doesn't deal in history anymore. Even if he did, supposedly, uh, come into history 2,000 years ago, that was then, this is now, God just doesn't care anymore. Um, especially atheists are kind of getting these kind of ideas going a lot. And once again, I mentioned about the whole New Age thing in the church. And uh, verses like this kind of really clarify about that. God is still working in human history. He's still intervening in human history. Uh, notice this. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out, present, to serve those who are going to, future, inherit salvation? He's talking about an ongoing work. They are sent out for those who will be. So these verse, verbs that are being used are, are pointing to the fact that God does still intervene on our behalf. He is still working a, in the world. I was watching a video and this atheist was saying, I would believe in God if God made the effort because he knows what would get me saved. So if he would just come to me one-on-one -on -one and do whatever that one thing is to get me saved, then I would believe. But that's the only way I'm believing. So basically rejection of scripture, rejection of everything else, has, God has to speak in this one way or he's not real. And the thing about that is God is speaking, he is acting, but if you already have your heart hardened, you're not going to see it. You're just not going to see it. Um, I can think of countless times just over the past couple of weeks in my own life that you know it should have gone another way and it didn't. Because God was intervening in that. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't want to bore you with the details, but I was talking to Thurman this week, and, and he told me a lot. Of, he always tells me interesting stories about the way that he uh, God intervened in his life. There was this one time that Thurman was, he was a little kid, and he got typhoid fever, I believe it was. And uh, sick, 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 sick. There was no chance this guy was going to pull through. And just some random people came to his house and said, hey, can we pray uh, for your son? And the mom's like, yeah, sure, whatever, go ahead. And so they go in, and they pray, and he makes a complete recovery. And his mom's like, you want to go see a movie? <laughs> I just thought that was the, the way he said it was really funny. I guess you had to be there, but it was funny. Uh, and he was telling me about the way that uh, in World War II when he was serving there, uh, he was in the bunker, and I told you guys this story already. Uh, he was in the bunker, and, uh, you know, they said, okay, everybody get to the bomb shelter. And he said, I'm not going. I just got off a double shift. <laughs> I'm going to bed. So he gets up in the morning and comes out, and there's a giant bomb right outside the entrance to the barracks. It had landed like this instead of like this, and so it never went off. And he was just like, oh, my. Well, it turns out his uncle had been praying for him uh, that night before uh, when it happened. And just like little, little things like that where it seems like, oh, God doesn't care anymore. Well, no, he does. He does. It just he's not babying you. Life is still going to smack you over the head. But God hasn't abandoned you. You know, they're, they're, he is still working uh, in, in, in the story of humanity. So let's look at the summary here. All, this is all chapter 1. Uh, verses 1 through 5, God spoke through his son. Uh, verses 6 through 7, angels serve and worship him, him being the son. Uh, verses 8 through 12, Jesus' throne is eternal, as he is also eternal. And verses 13 through 14, his kingdom is coming. So these are all kind of just a summary of what we're looking at, and that takes us directly into chapter 2. And chapter 2 starts with the idea of, so what is the, why is that important for us to know? That's exactly where chapter 2 heads right into. Uh, 